So my first sales role was working for Vodafone, repeating and refining the same pitch again and again. I did that right. I told you <laughs> about selling at the strip club. I wasn't just selling. I was hiring. I was firing. I was project manager for all of the projects. I moved to town. Nobody was buying for me. Okay, now I what the f do you this podcast. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the another episode of TED Talks. You know, the one thing is important in your business, it's the sales. Because some people can say that if you don't have sales, you don't have a business. And this is going to be a topic of our today's show. I would say as well, I know that I'm kind of stunting this, but having a full fridge of Diet Coke is equally important because then I don't have any staff. Well, we're joined here today by Tanvir Hassan. Hello, Tanvir. Hey, Tommy. But before we start, I want to ask you to subscribe to our channel, put the like button if you like this video, leave the comment if you think sales is important for business. And now... Ding dong the bell. Tanvir Hassan. Hey. Welcome to our world famous podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Really good to be here, guys. So give the audience an overview of who you are. Who I am? Goodness me, that's a big question. Very loaded. So I'm Sanvir. I'm the managing director of Attract. Um, but I'm so much more, you know. Um, and I guess, Handsome you know. Handsome <laughs> role model. <laughs> You could say that, you could say that. My mum certainly seems to think so anyway. Um, but no, genuinely, um, I guess in my position of leadership, I I started feeling like the business was I and I was the business. And it's actually only been recently that I've started to rediscover myself as well. How did you how did you start um attracting? Where does that come in? What's what's your story? My story? Oh, God. You know, it's a really good story. I don't think I've ever had the chance to tell either of you my full story. of yeah, how I, I don't know nothing about it. You don't know anything about me, yeah, right? Yeah. Before, 10 minutes ago, he didn't know who you were. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll give you the full spiel, man. Um, yeah, because uh, we called you because I think you are the probably one of the best salesmen I know. And I think... You can be really viable for this episode. So yeah, we are excited to hear your story. Sure. No, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And, and thank you for giving me this platform, guys. Um, so my background is actually really interesting. I grew up in Lincoln. I was I was privately educated until I wasn't. I went, then went to a grammar school and I was a very sharp kid. I was one of these like mathematical genius kids. And my parents wanted me to be a doctor. So that was actually my first path that was chosen for me. I was meant to be a medic. Um, left to my own devices, I probably would have been a mechanical engineer, actually, if, if I'd chosen what I wanted to do at uni. Uh, but there was, I mean, I, I chose to, to, to follow this path. You know, they didn't force me or anything. It's just kind of like, a oh, it wouldn't be nice if there was a doctor in the family. So I was like, cool, all right. Yeah, I can, I every, can. every family has that. My sister's the doctor, so... She took all the pressure off. Yeah, oh, so good. It got to me, and they, you know, they would have been happy if I washed cars for a living. You're very lucky. See, I was the eldest, and I was the eldest of five, and the only boy uh, in an Asian family. Um, <laughs> so that was that was that was my experience. It was it was academic. I actually had an offer to study medicine at Hull York Medical School when I was leaving school, uh, but that coincided with becoming a man. And as it so happens, I just got very distracted in my late teens by the world and and most, mostly it's women, to be fair. Um, and I actually ended up not meeting my offer for medicine and all of a sudden being, you know, without a paddle. Uh, so I did what every self-respecting person does and went into clearing, went to university to study biomedical sciences. Uh, so com completely unrelated, actually, to, to what I'm doing now. Why did you study that? So I went to the University of Hull, actually. Okay. Uh, I went to the University of Hull. I got there. I did very well. Um, ended up pursuing various things outside of studies. You know, I, I started a small cafe business with, with some friends whilst I was there. It was, it was just a nice place for me to kind of realise myself. But I actually ended up dropping out of uni when I was in Hull. Came back to Lincoln, rejoined university thinking I really ought to finish this, you know, since I, since I started it. And parallel to that, I started working in sales roles. 
So my first sales role was working for Vodafone. Actually, it was actually on the, on the high street in Lincoln, um, selling selling phones. And I was doing this part time whilst I was studying. And when I finished studying, I went on to do it full time. And in actual fact, it just came very, very naturally to me, I guess. Is it was the specific goal for a sales job or he was just trying out? Um, I think I just needed to earn something really more than anything. Um, I wanted to earn and I wanted to be in an, in an environment that sort of played into my natural strengths because I knew I was a talker. My nickname in my friendship group when I was at university was actually Lube uh, because uh, anytime I don't, we... <laughs> I don't actually want to know why and this is a child-friendly podcast. So. It is, it is. Well, anytime we tried to arrange anything and we used to do a lot of charity dinners You'd and things. You'd bring a bottle of Jorex. I would. <laughs> Lube <with you. laughs> And, here again. And some and some latex gloves. Uh no, I would I would actually um just, just be able to go in there and lubricate a situation, basically, because <laughs> that was that was kind of the 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 underlying joke. But I knew it was something I could do, and naturally I got there. And what was nice about phones at the time was it was a, a mature sales industry. There had already been an established process established by, by Vodafone, and it was kind of inspired by phones for you, for those who know of it was a big sort of pioneer in the way things were sold. And it was this prescriptive sales process that kind of listened to a solution and listened to a problem and offered a tailored solution. It was just, it was just a, a particularly good method of selling and I got very good at it. So I was flying. I was, I was top salesman in Lincoln. I got noticed very quickly throughout Vodafone. I got hired by somebody in Meadow Hall who wanted me at the bigger store. So I took on a more senior role. Uh, so I was essentially poached from Lincoln. And then after that, I, I just, I was, I was just in, in sales. You know, I became, I suppose, a career salesman. I sold phones. I sold cars. I sold kitchens. I sold talk talk broadband in the street. Um, wow, that was that was the worst think, sales job I had. Think you can sell talk talk broadband, a really how, shit broadband how, service. How much you yeah. was earning? I think it's very interesting questions for it's, a lot of our viewers. Yeah, well, talk it's talk broadband money. in the street. I actually I actually sold for zero salary, so it was entirely commission based. Okay, um, that was the lowest. Uh, but at the same time, I was doing very well with it. It was actually something of a pyramid scheme that I seemed to be working for, and I left <laughs> soon after. Um, but that was that was kind of the, the lowest. And in, as a as a kitchen salesman for running kitchens, I was taking home somewhere between sort of seventeen and eighty thousand pounds a year, actually, uh, on a basic salary of about 20k so it was it was i was again top performer uh in rent kitchens as well and i did very well i don't think necessarily because i'm the most talented salesman some people are very natural talented sales people i have some talent don't get me wrong uh but i think for me it was more because it gave me a platform for value creation i could solve somebody's problem somebody could come to me with a need I could address that with a range of available products and services, which are so vast that they themselves couldn't see head or tail for what they wanted. And I was in a position to tell them prescriptively because he likes gray and you like blue. I think, you know, you should have a chat and settle for this like gray, bluey tone here or whatever. I don't know. You know, it was, there was always something that I could do to try and make that journey smoother and easier uh, for the people to, to make a decision. So that by the end of any sales pitch, I, wor I worked it in such a way that there really wasn't any, 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 any door for them to escape through. You know, I, I made sure my sales journey engaged them sort of right from the start and, and resolved their, their concerns before I got to asking them for their business, you know? So that's why I think I did very well in sales. Um, I did very well everywhere that I worked. What I did find with it working in sales was that it, it got quite repetitive. It's a, it's a repetitive job. You, you, you're essentially repeating and refining the same pitch again and again. You can't you can't improvise everything. I mean, everyone's different. Every customer that you deal with is different and what they need is different. But what you say is roughly the same. Is it important what you're selling or the process about the same, no matter what the product is? It's actually slightly different. And I discovered this coming into Attract. And I'll tell you in a, in a moment yeah. how, how that actually happened. Yeah. But when you're selling digital for example, services yeah, yeah. Was first he was selling phones yes then broadband yes. then kitchens it's yes. three not related to each other 
product. No, no, it's true. It's true. Completely unrelated, actually. And I think people buy these things differently. I think, you know, kitchens, for example, are a very aspirational purchase. I've just bought my first house. You know, I've just bought my dream home. I want the kitchen to be the hub of the home. I want it to be wonderful. I want it to be the place where everybody goes. I want it to be the place where when my friends come and visit, they look at it and they're like, wow, your kitchen is so nice. So there, there's there, there's a lot of kind of, it's a very aspirational sort of purchase. And with that sort of thing, there's there's a particular way to work things. When you're selling a solution, you've got to be a bit more prescriptive. You've got to be a bit more kind of responsive, I guess, and a bit more, a bit more diagnostic, you know, because at the end of the day, when you're selling to businesses, you're not selling, you know, to, to their egos in any massive way. You're selling more to address a need. Uh, and that need is, you know, it, it has, you know, a budget and, and it has to be met and it has to produce return on that investment as well. So it's a slightly different playground and it took some adjusting actually coming from kitchens to selling digital services. But at the end of it all, what you're dealing with is people um, and people people buy from people is the adage that, that we used to use in sales. Yeah, I think especially in small towns like Lincoln, yeah, people yeah. more trust other people than brand or company or I think anything so. else. Yeah. yeah, I think for us, it's something that I, I definitely noticed when I moved to Lincoln from Sheffield was that there were a lot of agencies here and it took a while to figure out that actually the one thing that I didn't have compared to everyone else was any relationships and trust. I think that we have quite a small, tight-knit community uh, at events. You know, it's the same people going every single time. So why... Why would someone buy from a stranger here? It's quite, it's quite difficult because I think when people are buying from people, they're, they're buying that trust. So yes, it was quite an interesting one for us here. Yeah, you're uh, again getting everything so sad. It was some quite positive note, like pitches, sales, and you came. Oh, when I moved to town, nobody was buying from me. <laughs> that's why morning. people that's why people not watching our channel you know <laughs> i feel like you're doing yourself a dis- you should be more positive there. i feel like you're doing yourself Everyone a disservice was buying there, from me. yeah no no i'd buy from you i wouldn't no <laughs> <laughs> why not that's that's a bad spirit <laughs> so how so you went from obviously selling like we just said so you, you were in kitchens yes and, and doing well why why the hell did you start an agency well it's an interesting one i suppose i mean it it came with a massive pay cut i i i cut my salary down to about a fifth of what it was in the first year uh and it was a big hit to take for me uh but it's the best thing i ever did by far purely because I think I'm one of these people that spent his entire life looking for a sense of purpose. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm from an entrepreneurial family. I always saw business being done and I just knew what the possibilities were. I never really saw myself tied massively to, to, to any workplace. It's certainly not one that, one that, you know, purely wanted me to, to sell things for them. You know, I was making the owners of these companies millionaires multiple times over a year, you know, and, and I was, I was seeing a, a healthy salary, but not like any, anywhere near what they were seeing, you know, for, for, for what, for the work I was doing. And I suppose I grew tired, I guess, of that. And I wanted to do something for myself. And I knew what was going to be in the digital services space. I think, I think this is where I saw the future. I was, I was always very excited by by this space you know and, and the things people did uh and all the disciplines ranging from 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 film to marketing to design to web you know to to, to the more sort of analytic data-driven stuff it was all kind of where i saw the world was heading and i didn't have any technical proficiencies one thing about me is i sit at the head of an agency where i've got graduates and people working for me who, who are technically experts in their field you know to some extent they're, they're, they're very good better at what they do than I could be, you know, at this moment in time. But for me, it's about seeing the value in those things and understanding how those things could benefit the people that, that need them, I guess. That's interesting. And how you decide that it will be digital services? Do you found a um, gap in the market that you can sell it or you find some people who can do it and you think that you might use them or how does that happen? Well, actually, that's 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 where Georgie comes in. Um, Georgie is a good friend of mine. Uh, Georgie and I worked together actually 
Uh, he's, a, he's, he's my co-director and, and good friend. And we actually started working together bit before I even started working at Vodafone. I was working at a small kiosk in a shopping center that sold phone cases and accessories. And this was my unit and Georgie came along to be the part timer. And we became very good friends and we, we'd spend majority of the day just fannying about in the shopping center to be fair but talking big you know talking about things that we wanted to do and after after some time georgie thought he'd try things and i supported him with these with these ventures and these ventures were sort of small sort of web-based businesses you know one one was selling products it was it was those hoverboards those gyro boards that 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 you you go on and one was a, a merchandising business and we would have really benefited from from digital services at this point, but we just couldn't afford them. You know, I remember going to a couple of places and getting quotes um, in the tens of thousands and thinking, "Holy shit, you know, we can't. We really can't afford this." You know, this this is not you know something that we're going to be able to do. And parallel to that, we came across another nice nice man who was a friend of George's and mine, called Bjorn, who who was running his own agency. He ran an agency Bjorn, called RSL Bjorn. Yes, right, RSL Bjorn. Bjorn. Bjorn's the man. What? What you say? Beyond from RSL. Beyond. 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 B J O R N. I think you get first two letters. Scandinavian. Okay. Yeah. Well, Beyond. If you know Beyond, you'll know that he's he he he, he talks a really really good game. He's an inspiring man. You know. And he's going to be on the podcast actually. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> I don't like know it. what you're talking about. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just I'm just, just working here. <laughs> I'm just work here. <laughs> so Bjorn, Bjorn, Bjorn ran his own agency and he had all this knowledge and he was so willing to share it at that time. And Georgie lapped it all up. And within a very short space of time, he was having a go at his own design at his own website, at his own marketing, at his own social media accounts. He was buying, selling accounts. He was seeing tangible results and sales directly from the activities he was doing. And, and this is, this is, this was the start of something, you know, I was watching him do all this from the side. I was helping him to sell his products in person. Actually, we'd go to events. We, we went to Comic-Con in London. I met Benedict Cumberbatch, you know, I, I, all of these things happened. We went to all these different events to sell these products and, 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 and market them. And when we built up something of a worldwide audience, we had customers in New York, we had customers in Australia, Dubai, all buying these t-shirts every single time a new one got released. And it was a really, really good experience, you know, and we realized that these skills translated so well, uh, into, into, into the things that we wanted to do. George actually ended up working for somebody and using the, the very same skill set professionally. And he did that for some time whilst I was off on my jollies doing sales. And it was actually whilst I was on a cigarette break at Red Kitchens one day that I got a phone call from Georgie. And the phone call was, yo, man, I've just rage quit my job. Yeah, uh, a, an abridged <laughs> version of this story uh, when you did a talk at <laughs> the Tribe. Yes. Amazing. <clears throat> what is the Tribe? It was a networking event in Lincoln. Okay. Is it something about digital businesses or just general it's entrepreneurs like a, it's like a general young entrepreneurs group really tribe city tribe is is kind of aiming to bring young entrepreneurs and young professionals of a certain age bracket and don't quote me on what that age bracket is but the idea is to build something of a momentum for, for young people in linkedin okay. which i think is. and you were a speaker there i was a speaker there I've, I've been a speaker at a few things now i actually i'm not a huge fan of public speaking by the way and i'm always impressed by people i'm, I'm always impressed by tommy when he's on a on a panel because i i personally really really don't like being being in front of a big crowd of people mm. stick me in front of four people and i i can talk endlessly uh, but as soon as i look up and there's a hundred people i'm like oh god like do i really want to be here <laughs> yeah I, I used to feel like that though i think i don't know why it suddenly flipped and i'm fine i have yeah. no idea don't um, use this basic advice just imagine everyone naked no we could, i did that right i told you <laughs> about selling at the strip club no, <laughs> <laughs> this is yeah. the best thing that's ever happened to me in business, actually. Um, so you know that I had the alcohol startup Festico with Charlie. Yeah, uh, tell us about it, because I don't really know. Just short in one minute. I had a alcohol startup called Festico with Charlie. Um, right next, <laughs> so we basically redesigned a hard seltzer. Um, it was a startup. I left it in January. Is 
Yeah, we don't care about this. What is the drink? Just quick. It's soft drink with a little amount of alcohol. Yeah, 4% alcohol. Yeah. Tastes really nice. Dangerously nice. As part of my role with that, so I was obviously co-director for, well, I, I ran the agency, but then I also had that with Charlie. Um, and one of the times I was going to sell, and this is actually what gave me loads of confidence in sales, because I always got nervous, especially when I started the agency, because you kind of needed every sale. So I was nervous going into sales meetings. And then as the agency stabilized, I still, I wasn't comfortable with sales, but I wasn't nervous either. So I was, I was kind of neutral. But then with the alcohol brand, me and Charlie went to go and sell uh, to Desire, the strip club in Lincoln. Nice. And I don't know if you've ever been the first person in a strip club, but it's an awkward, awkward time because it just opened. So it opened at eight on a Friday. I was in there at 8.01. Wow, that's right. eager. And um, so we walked up to the bar. There's nobody in there because if you're the first person in a strip club, you should be in prison, right? Walked up to the bar. It was like, Why? Because we were asking for the manager because we had an appointment. All the girls like turned around in, you know, just kind of strip club attire. So there wasn't a lot going on in terms of material. All of them facing the bar, you're thinking... Hello, looking at the floor. We asked for the manager, came and sat down, and then it was it was kind of all right because we were sat in the corner of the strip club away from everyone and we could kind of right relax. It's just a normal meeting now. It's fine. We're halfway through the sales presentation and then we're saying, Oh, do you want to taste it? We brought, you know, four cans. She says, Yeah, I'll see what the girls think of it as well. Girls, and they all come totting around, like stand in a semicircle, all of them pretty much naked. You're gonna get lap dance. Well, didn't get a lap dance, no. But they had a tasting session. <laughs> the trick. But they were all stood in a semicircle around me. Charlie literally couldn't speak. He froze. He died a death. I can imagine Charlie. Charlie was quite nervous in that yeah. situation, actually, knowing the guy. He, he went. Um, so he sort of just cowered into himself, like looking at the floor and making a lot of eye contact. I'm passing the drinks around like, what did you think of the drink? Like, just look in the eyes. What did you think? To the, did you like the drink? And um, yeah, after that, we walked back. We were kind of giggling for 20 minutes on the way back to the office. I can imagine. But after that experience, I thought, if I can go in there and sell that, I can sell anything to anyone and feel <laughs> nothing. But it's things like that with public speaking as well, where I don't need to imagine people naked to speak because I know what that's like and it doesn't make it any easier. Um, but what I did find, <laughs> I'm trying to make it relevant. First, first, first hand experience. <laughs> I went off on a tangent again. I think that's going to be a feature of this podcast. Yeah. Like, did I tell you that story of when I crashed that motorbike through a window <laughs> and then tie it back to? So sustainability. <laughs> well, it's. Uh, I realized that every episode you have some kind of story. You hide and you keep in them. I don't know if you imagine them or you just keep in. It's a real story. Yeah. You last need to time, ask Charlie about that. Last time it was the whole story about Amazing. how he quit work in Subway. Nice. Yeah. nice. If you want to hear the story, you can go to our channel and look on episode two. Uh, and there will be an amazing story about how Tommy quit the Subway work mm. and why he can be hired in any Subway again. <laughs> <laughs> there was a lot more to that subway story as well. That's why it kind of fizzled out at the end, because I was like, if I keep speaking, I'm going to get cancelled. <laughs> um, anyway, public speaking is difficult, right? Yes. Uh, but no, I think that as I've done more and more of it, it's not that the actual public speaking is any easier. It's just that my kind of mentality towards it changed, where I think to start with, when you're public speaking, it's always difficult because you it's the perceptions of other people and you're really worried about, you know, what people are going to think, especially if you say something wrong. But as I kind of got more confident in myself and I knew that I had something of value to say, and then I didn't really worry about what people thought because if people liked it, sure, they can like it. If they don't, they don't. But either way, I'm going to be getting off the stage in 10 minutes. It was sort well, of a game changer. I have actually opposite. So for me, I really worried when I speak to three, four people, to small group or direct one to one. I'm really worried about it. It's really hard for me. But when it's the crowd and I'm on the stage, I don't care. Uh -huh. And yeah, that's completely different. I don't know why, but I kind of it doesn't matter for me when it's hundred people there and yeah. I just start to speak because I can't focus on anyone. 
and I'm kind of speaking just to myself in a way. Yeah. Um, sure. Because there's so many people, and are you imagining yeah. all of these people naked? By the way, because no. that, that might explain it. Because three or four people, I guess you've got more time to look. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that, I didn't that, try it because I don't really look on people when I'm have uh, speak in public. I I usually try to not make any contact with anyone in the crowd. I just try to look somewhere where no eyes. Uh, so I still have eye contact with something. But not it's just a lamp post outside. <laughs> <laughs> see, see, what I tend to do is I look around and I try and find two or three faces at various points in the room that I can see are looking dead back at me and are smiling at me. And I'll just talk to those people rather than kind of trying to address the whole room. I'll just be like talking for this guy for two minutes, that guy for two minutes and this guy for two minutes. And uh, just, just because it, it just it just makes it easier, I guess, to focus. Because um, the minute one of them starts like looking at their phone, you're like, oh, I'm boring him. You know, like, you do. You do get this Imagine stars. how this person worried. Yeah. When you just look on him. <laughs> and he probably think. So the you thing about him? sales is <laughs> get off your phone. Get off your phone. <laughs> Loops talking now. You kind of, yeah. <laughs> and if you ask something, I hope you're not bored. I hope you're not Make bored. Make a pause. <laughs> is there contact with this person? <laughs> Make them feel really guilty. And I think uh, like the best part about public speaking as well, and another thing that can stop you being nervous is even if a hundred of the hundred people are all bored shitless, nobody's going to say a thing. No. Because British yeah. people in general are too polite. So you just oh well, what do you if you're not in Britain? I don't know what what do you guys do? <laughs> <laughs> Catch the person after the show. <laughs> Beat them to death with some of your butcher meat. If you want to hear a story about Ed being a butcher, episode one. <laughs> so amazing creative so, agency. Yes, let's go off on a tangent. So you started the creative agency with Georgie. Yes. Um, at some point, although you kind of joined him, as far as I know anyway, from the conversations we've had before. So Georgie kind of solo started the agency a little bit on his own. Then afterwards, you came in. What was the hardest part, do you think, about getting that business off the ground? Ooh. See, we had a very challenging journey as an agency, I guess, because we incorporated ourselves on the October before COVID and we were just starting to pick up. So the first few jobs that we got were from people that we knew, people that within our network we knew would benefit from the services that we did. So we started building things up and then we got some really good contracts and those contracts were in the retail space, they were in the hospitality space. And as soon as March hit, all of these guys wanted to cancel. They all, they were just left. They were like, you know what, actually, um, we've changed our mind. You know, at the moment because of COVID, we don't know what's happening. Uh, we'll, we'll get back to you guys later. And we weren't especially like contracted up at this point or anything with anyone, you know, it was just provisional sort of arrangements to do people's services. So we lost everything very shortly after starting. And it took us back to the drawing board. So the hardest thing that we're at, at that stage that we had to do, and uh, I guess was, was hone in on what our, our skills were and whittle it down to something that we actually did well and, and to focus on that point. I guess it's a piece of business development that happens to everybody who starts a business. They they start broad and saying, oh, we can do this, we can do that, we can do everything. I know we're a chicken shop, but we also do burgers, you know, and, and, and all of this happens. And then all of a sudden, at one point or another, you've got to be really good at one thing and, 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 and be good at it. And for, and for us, that was design, actually. So design was the first main service that attracted offered and we came up with a really nice model that worked for us uh, in terms of a retainer and then from there we we, we also started selling a number of sort of brand and web projects uh, and that was the next thing that came along and you know it just it just it just spiraled what happened after that point was the bona fide like exponential growth curve like we literally, you know, the, the first thing I saw, the first website I sold was about 400 quid. The next one was about two grand. The next thing, a, a year later, there were 16 grand. A year later after that thing, I was selling things for 180 grand, you know, so it was just genuinely just, just spiraling upwards beyond this point, basically, because I was building 
a team. I was surrounded by more and more expertise. We hired a full stack developer. We hired more designers. We hired marketing people. At one point we had about 12, 13 people working in Attract actually. Wow. That's a lot. That's a big team. How you was managing that? So you, you was doing the sales, most of it for your company. You was looking for a client. Yeah. How I get, yeah, there's what's no one else who can do this work. But same time, you need to think about developing company, about managing people. And it, it was quite new for you. With bigger problems, you, you, you end up with harder to deliver solutions, you know? And, and as it was, as we were doing these things, I wasn't just selling, I was hiring, I was firing, I was project manager for all of the projects, as well as kind of chief strategist for all solutions. Uh, you know, so all of these things were kind of having to come from me and at the same time as having this team. And it was really good having Georgie kind of by my side to help me manage this because it was a lot of work, you know, and, and Georgie has a very good talent with people and bringing out the best in them. So for many of the sort of design team, he was, he's always kind of been their coach and mentor. Uh, for me, it's kind of been sort of marketing operatives that have sat under me. So we've kind of split the responsibilities quite neatly actually between us at the time. And yeah, it worked. It worked. We were able, I guess, to continue to deliver. And I think what's really nice about our journey so far is we've managed to delight a lot of people with our work. You know, it's it's going really well. Everybody who we work with is, is, is just so happy with the standard of the work that they're receiving, especially with the cost that they're paying. You know, so it, I guess I guess we've always gone in on quality and that's kind of been our thing. Um, so that's been nice. And I guess, you know, here we are, 2023. And what actually happened this year was really interesting. This year... We didn't achieve the same volume of sales that we did in previous years. We didn't have the exponential growth this year. We kind of flatlined. I had a couple of months where I, I was seeing that as well. Um, we, we picked up in the last six weeks, but we had the first, well, probably from March to June is basically dead. I got really worried. Um, cash flow became a huge issue, but then out of nowhere, back on track and I think we've probably now had our busiest month that we've ever had in terms of turnover from being sort of flatlined so yeah I don't know whether there's something in the market at the moment I, I don't know but I know a, a lot of agencies are feeling a similar thing so you do something for it or it just happened by itself what to, what to change to get situation? Back up. Yeah. so I I went into sort of fight or flight contacted a lot of clients uh that we have and said do you need any more help um I got a resounding yep we need loads of stuff. Uh, so that was brilliant. So we picked up uh, maybe six, seven grand's worth of work from existing clients. Um, okay. Then we've got a new project coming in for, I don't know, it's a like medium sized kind of brand product, yeah. some retainer, that which in the next couple of months will be, let's say 10 grand. Um, and then a few more retainers on the card. So um, we've gone. Yeah. So I guess good, good thing was that you ask old clients yeah or do any more work for them yeah farming versus hunting farming is is what me and georgie between ourselves call the process of trying to extract more business out of an existing happy customer base versus hunting which is taking yourself out there and and and, and sniping out some new new clients basically uh, and both are so important for a business. You you really, you know, it's sometimes for us in Attract, the, the farmer saved us. Uh, and sometimes for us in Attract, the, 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 the hunting has saved us. You know, the, I suppose, you know, the, the securing a new business, a, a new client is always, it always feels a little bit more glorious, doesn't it? You know, to, to have somebody completely new, somebody of a, of a bigger caliber, perhaps, than your existing customer base to say, oh, we're working with a multinational now, you know, is a, is a really nice thing to be able to say. But in actual fact, Revenue is revenue. And if your existing customer base within your relationship with them is able to produce more work for you, if you're able to sell them different services that you offer or variations on the service that you offer that that might help them to continue to see value in your relationship, that's a really, really good source of cash. You know, all of our relationships at the moment are, are, are coming sort of two years plus. Um, and that's just because, you know, we've we've been able to offer a service and then that's led to a different service sort of coming along and, and us doing something different for the same people. Yeah, I think I think for me too that, that that's been a really huge driver of our growth because it's it's really, really difficult when Let's say you go to a networking event, for instance, 99.9% .9 of people you'll meet at a networking event aren't ready to buy and wouldn't become your customer. Um, and everybody sell to each other. 
Yeah, well, it, it depends. It depends where you go, to be honest. Um, obviously, that's a part of it. But I think that when you get a customer in, if you can just hold on to them and get some kind of retainer out of them, um, it's a really great way to grow in, in a stable way. Because like you said, when you're hunting all the time, that brings a lot of pressure with it to be able to deliver those projects. And then if you're managing staff as well to get those projects delivered, it's really stressful for you. It can be stressful for the staff. And I think that as a general impact on, you know, culture and what's happening in the workplace can be really negative. But if you can stably hold on to existing customers and month by month help them on a retainer basis, then you're able to forecast better, which means that, you know, you know what's coming in to the bank account at the end of the month before the month's even started. It means that you can grow steadily. And then every time you take on existing project work, it just kind of, you get the hunt, you get the payout. And then if you can keep them, then you're slowly, you're not growing exponentially, but you're growing get stably. some kind of stability. Yeah. 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 Constant. This, yeah. This is it. I think good results take time as well. I think the, the, the industries that we work in have a requirement for time to be taken and thought to be exacted. And, you know, experimentation, I guess it's a very experimental kind of industry. You know, you, you try things, you know, some things work really well, some things work slightly well, you do a bit more of the things that work better, you know, and you, and you fine tune uh, and you and you adapt and you change, you change to new products, new 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 environments, you know, it's, it's really important, I guess, to have, give yourself that space within which to achieve that. And building a good retainer base is currently one of my big focuses at the moment actually because as much as i like a good project don't get me wrong projects are great you know you you you, you scope it you do it you build it you see it being built it's like building a house you know by the end of it you're like wow i can't believe i built this you know it's really cool but they are very feast or famine you know if projects do tend to come in thick and fast when they're doing when they don't you're sort of wondering where the next one's going to come along from and that can be quite uncomfortable especially when you've got wages to pay you know when you've got a big wage bill on your shoulders uh my wage bill at one point was up was 15k you know um and you have to try and generate that consistently and it's very hard when you when you don't have the sales to back it up yeah it's exactly the same for me as well um i think you know project work of course we need project work and we always need to be working on a big project but we need to build the retainers because i think for us especially what we're finding is that we're getting big projects in on a you know, sort of cash basis, let's say every couple of months, one big project that we work on for, you know, six to eight weeks. But then the retainers aren't high enough to stop the bank account going down if we don't have another project. So our retainers probably cover 70-ish percent of our costs. But that means we always need the hunt because the hunt is building the bank account up, but then the retainers are stopping it not falling through the floor. But we need to be breaking even on retainers. And I think that it's a numbers game. I think the longer you've been in the game and the more clients you've got, the more you can keep with you for some kind of recurring monthly fee, the better. But I think for us, it's almost just waiting because every new client we get now, I'm not interested in taking on a big project if it's not going to lead to some kind of retainer because um, that's they're, they're not the clients for us. Um, I'd rather have a customer pay me even 200 pounds a month and 10 grand up front because over years, you, you know, you're way more stable. You're getting roughly the same kind of money and you're able to grow with the bit, uh, the customer. Yeah, for me, it's hard to get retainer work because uh, my mo biggest, my most revenue of my company, the yeah, fucking, uh, most of your revenue. English. <laughs> <laughs> I'll most translate. Of, <laughs> most of revenue of my business is based on big projects and a big cash flow from each project and any retainer job I can propose to client will be low paid and this low paid will took not much less effort than for whole project itself and it just have no sense mm. and if I take a couple of them it will be really difficult to do it all in time and without actually making any money yeah so for me it's always hunt hunt and I'm still fighting myself I'm thinking oh I need to offer some cheaper services, but then I think it have no sense because it will just make me broke. And sales for me, it's always the hardest part because I have no problem to deliver the project, no matter how difficult it is, how big it is. It's, I find a way it's never was a problem, but it's the always problem to find one. I'm really bad on sales. I hate sales. 
because I hate it because I can't do it. Yeah. Because every time I'm speaking to a client, I get some problem that I start to think, oh, that's probably too expensive for you. Oh, I wouldn't suggest that, which is opposite. Or client get to me and say, we have idea, can you do it? And I start to tell them, this is actually not a good idea. Uh, let's try something else so you can save some money. And I'm always care about them, mm -hmm. which is make my revenue smaller all the time. And I'm doing it all the time. I'm so bad in sales. So if you have some tips or some advice for someone like me who really bad in sales, who don't know what to do, uh, yeah, can you share it with us? Sure, sure thing, Edgar. No, absolutely, man. I do understand it. I guess, you know, ultimately, money is oxygen for a business. Without sales, you don't have, you know, you don't have a business because ultimately you're not able to meet, you know, your your, your costs with 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 revenue to, 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 to set against them, you know. So you need to be generating consistent sales. You consistently need to be selling things profitably and those things need to, need to be continuous, you know. You need to be able to almost predict where your next client's coming from in order for you to comfortably run a business, I guess. So knowing where your next sale's coming from is important. Now... I'll, I'll take you through kind of stage by stage what I consider to be the priority. So number one, I think, is you have to believe in what you do. You have to believe in your proposition. And, and that's, that's, that's entirely like in, in what you do. And that's not just in terms of your own skills and your ability to deliver on them, but also in terms of what your proposition actually is on paper. You know, because if you're not able to explain what you do, in a short space of time, what 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 it is that, that you're going to deliver in terms of a solution, you you kind of screwed because you know you could you could sit there reeling off every single thing that you could do, but you need to have very sort of defined and specific things that you do, and you need to know who you're doing them for, and you need to understand what problem it is that you're solving for them because what people are looking for when they come to you for a service isn't necessarily just somebody to deliver that service. They're looking for somebody to relieve them of something that keeps them up at night. You know, it's something that they know they can't do because they don't have the technical proficiencies. They don't know anybody else who'll do it. So they're sitting in front of you because, you know, they if, if, if their dad did it, they'd have gone to their dad. But, you know, clearly they, they need somebody, you know, they need somebody to come along and tell them with knowledge and reassurance that you, you're going to pay some money to me. It's going to be a fair price for what you're asking for. You're going to get the best possible outcome out of me that you could possibly get, you know? And by the end of this, your boss is going to be really happy with you or your customers are going to be really happy with you, you know? And, and that's kind of the reassurance that people need. So I guess people come to you because they have a problem and you end up this, this sort of journey of kind of them telling you who they are and you telling them who you are and, you know, them explaining their need. And the most important thing at the point of listening to somebody talk about their problem is to really, really take it in, not just in terms of literally what they're saying, but, but you know, the, the new of it just to understand kind of where their where their fears are about this thing you know because what, what, they might don't know what they want they might they not. think they don't sometimes i realize that that in video production that people uh say that they want video but it's kind of not what they really want and they don't really want video they want to sell their services they want invest some money in some video product advertising some marketing materials to yeah. get their money back yeah usually they don't need your video. They don't care about your art or picture, how it look. It can be uh, filmed on the phone, but it should give them money back and then they will happy. But I see a lot of clients, they order in video, expensive one and spend a lot of money on some expensive commercial and then not use it at all or just upload it to their website. And it's not really working. It's not bringing them any lead. And they say video is not working, you know, but it's, because they, they use it wrong. They don't really, I don't know how to yeah. say it, but. Well, I, th I think you know, what you were saying earlier when we started this question, when you were saying that, you know, customers are coming to you, they're telling you what they think they need. And then you're kind of outselling yourself in a way by saying, look, I don't think that's a good idea. You should do this. The other option that I think, you know, is on the table is cheaper. You'll get more from it. When you're raising that at the start, you were sort of saying that that's, you know, that's a bad thing. But I think actually to be able to honestly 
advise a client that their idea sucks and you have a cheaper option that's going to be way better for them that's going to really build trust and then i think moving on from that and and this is what we've experienced is that if the customer goes for it then all of a sudden your relationship is great they really trust everything you've got to say and then when they're looking for more projects they'll come back to you or they just don't go for it at all but then they know that they can trust you because you didn't want to take their expensive project that wasn't going to work. So they think actually, you know, Edgar's not going to rip me off if I go to him. And then the biggest impact that's had on us is referrals. So we've had in the last couple of months, we've had two people ask us for, you know, kind of introduction calls. Both of them have said something along the lines of, look, we've come to you because we've heard that you've got a good reputation for, you know, just generally being honest. And being able to advise someone whether they think it's a good thing or not. And one of the projects that came to us was, um, well, something that we just don't want to do anymore. Um, and I told him up front and then he referred somebody else onto us for a project that we do want. And that's that's the one that we're taking on now. And that just stems from kind of being honest. Know what, yeah, what it's you can important, do. I think, to um, deliver to client the idea that you not ask plumber to fix your car. No. And same should be with other digital services. If you get someone who making video content, for example, or websites, you should ask them how to do it right, I think. Yeah. Tell them, oh, make me this website and it should do this one. Sometimes it works, but usually if you get to professionals and ask for service. Yeah. It's true. It's custom. true. I mean, that that's 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 really important. Actually, I think it's it's a phenomenal point that you've raised. Honesty. It, I mean, that's 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 a really really nice thing to be known for. So well done, and kind of being able to achieve that with people because it's so important. I think for people to be able to trust you. You know, they, they they can like you and they can be aware that you're really good. That you you can come across as being really technically marvelous at what you do. I am the best technical SEO expert for in a fifty mile radius. You could be, but unless they believe that your expertise in that space is actually going to benefit them, and you're sitting there willing, looking them in the face and saying, "Look, not only am I really good at this thing, but I'm on your side. I'm going to help you with this skill." To help you to achieve your, you know, end goal out of all of this, and I think that's that's the key. I think it's it's fifty percent down to your knowledge and your skills and your abilities to deliver, and the other half is quite literally to do with whether or not they like you on the basis of how you come across to them as as a person. Essentially, can they trust you? What about opposite? If you looking for services and somebody try to sell you, do you maybe? can give us some advice how to protect yourself to be sell some bad services, but from good seller. Yeah. Well, I'm probably the worst customer in the sense that I never really buy anything on, on, on first look, not, not unless it's like an is, aspiration. Is there any just... signs of when person try to scam you? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. I think, I think certainly in our space, for example, I think people get very good at a certain thing. And any inquiry that comes their way, they try very hard to convince that inquiry why the thing that they do is the thing that this person needs, irrespective of whether they need that thing or not. And I think this is what started to give our industry a bad rep. I think, you know, the marketing profession, unfortunately, is full of people trying to miss sell services to other people who, you know, at, at a premium um, on the promise of, of things that they might not even need, you know. So one thing that I've got at the moment is a really, really good network, which you guys are part of, actually. And anytime anything comes my way that I don't have the capacity or the or the skill set in my internal team to deal with it, I know exactly where to send them because I know people who offer the services that they need and not only just offer them, offer them well and at a good price point and things, you know, so I'm able to to make those connections. And that goes, that goes you know, really far. The majority of instances we do offer the thing that this person sell that, that this person wants you know they come along they've got a problem we've got a solution and the first stage is connection the first stage is sitting down and on a human level trying to get into that person's shoes being able to kind of say well actually you know what as the new head of marketing for this large company 
I can see that you've got the odds stacked against you, actually, because these are some quite big shoes to fill. I can see that you're trying to bring a slightly di different direction into your company. And I can see why that is so important to you. And being able to just to get on their level and appreciate where they're coming from and meet them there is is very important in that first piece of contact, you know. And I think once you've managed to establish that, you've got an audience, you know. Prior to that, they don't know who you are. You don't know who they are. And as far as they're concerned, you're just another name off Google. So the first priority is to not be just another name, but to be a human that they connected with, I think. I think he tried to sell us something. I'm buying it. <laughs> it's lube. <laughs> <laughs> what about the trends? Uh, so in last year, all industry is significantly changing and keep changing. Is it any tools what helping now in sales, in running business, in your opinion, and how it helping? Oh, that's a good question. I some think software or something you're using, maybe some new tools. To be fair, I'm I'm quite old school with my tools in that I just need a good CRM system to be able to track my my communications because it's parallel to being the the, the salesperson. I'm also the account manager for, for for all of my clients. So being able to remind myself when to check in with them and being able to remind myself, you know, when they're due for renewal. For me right now, it's just as important as as being able to see where they are in terms of the buying process. Because you will pitch to people and they will be either ready there and then to pull their credit card out on the spot, or they will see the value in what you do. They'll hear the price and be like, cool, well, actually, you know what? That is the right thing. I know that's what I want, but I just can't afford it right now, you know, or I don't have the bandwidth for it right now. I didn't that's what realize. I usually say. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, your services are great. Can't afford it. And usually they don't bother me anymore. That's why he's banned from McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> Not banned from there. They still can order online. <laughs> With You're my bank card. Using different names. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's, it's honesty that you need from your customer at this point. Because once you've told them what you do, once you've told them how you do it and why it's so good for them, you're going to tell them a price. And that's a very, very crucial moment because what you've done is you've built them up and you've built them up and you've built them up. And all of a sudden you told them a price and they've come crashing down. They're right down here right now. So how are you going to build them back up is the question, right? At what, how do you do that? Because in face-to-face -face sales, that was quite easy because I could just look them dead in the face and be like, so that's 30,000 pounds. Mm -hmm. For three chicken you know, nuggets, <laughs> you know, and that was that was fine because I could just watch them squirm for two minutes. But when you're selling services, like you need to be able to gauge from them, firstly, whether that fits with what they do. You know, if they're saying to you after that, oh, we've got to get three more quotes. Chances are, the reason that wasn't a yes there and then is because that's either, in their opinion, the wrong thing for them or the wrong price for them, basically. When, when in your process do you give an indication of cost? Um, so I, do you find out everything then put the proposal together? So I'm asking you know, I, what works well for us and we, to be honest, I think with our services, we, we never get anyone squirming at prices because we set them up for it almost straight away. In the initial call, so I'm gonna ring up and say, say I want a website, I want a brand. And I'll say, okay, based on what you're saying right now, we still need to find more info. It's going to be between X and Y. And then we're already sort of building them up for that straight away and then make it really clear to them. And we'll say, look, you know, this is based on what we understand right now. If we, you know, talk for another couple of weeks and you want to add in e-commerce and you want to add in X, Y, and Z, and you want all these extra deliverables, the price is going to go up. But for this, and give them a short framework, drop it on an email before we even come to quoting. And what I find that that roots out a lot of people that, you know, wanted a website and rebrand for £999 because they've seen it on Google for £58 from some freelancer in Argentina. Yeah, that's probably the same related problem for me. It's hard to know what the client budget is. And the other problem is that I can make video in any budget. Yeah. It just depends how good it will be and what we can do. And a lot of leads are asking me how much it's gonna cost. Yeah. And I don't know, it co can cost 50 pounds. It can cost 50,000 pounds, how mm. much you have. Yeah. But it's 
make me sound like I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. Instead of other ones, just tell them price straight away. Yeah. Well, I, I can say roughly, you know, it can be. Yeah, but for every client, it's so different. How to find out the client budget? Well, that's a good one, actually. And to be fair, I, what Tommy said there is is, is 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 quite on point. Sometimes it is nice just to be quite forthcoming, you know, with them because you can then separate. Because there's so much variation in people's understanding of what these services cost. Some people think a, a website for £100 is expensive. Some people think a website for, for £100,000 is appropriate. You know, like there's, there's such a, a variety in that market that, that being able to kind of in the early stages to qualify them is, is a good idea. Some of the better agencies around here, they will say quite outwardly when you ring them and you start making an inquiry or on their website near their inquiry form, we do not work with budgets less than £10,000 is is quite a common thing to hear or we do not work with budgets less than twenty thousand pounds so and when you're in a position of luxury to be able to do so you know you can you can say things like that and and you can just take on business that can afford your services but in the early stages where you're looking what i've found is it's good to have an idea of what you're offering and be able to have some sort of banding because fundamentally these things are quite modular. Websites, for example, the more features you add, you add an e-commerce functionality to a website, it, it becomes more and you know, how long is a piece of string, right? But if you have some ballparks in your head for, well, between this price and work within ranges rather than sort of specific prices, ranges to say, look, between one and 3K, we can work with that. And this is the sort of thing that you'd between achieve. Between 50 pound and 50,000. Yes. <laughs> no, I think we, so me and Tanvir recently went on uh, an agency growth uh, series of workshops. And one of the things they spoke about on there, which could potentially help you is they spoke about coming up with so everyone likes the kind of netflix pricing the one that's you know it costs they'll pay you to watch netflix essentially for the first one but you can only watch it on you know on a casio calculator quality the middle one which they want you to go for and then the more expensive one which is only a bit more expensive than the first one um but one of the ideas and tan you can elaborate on this was having two projects presenting two projects to the client when you're happy with either of them because you need to be, or else going back to what Tam was saying earlier, you can't, if you're not confident in that you've got the right solution, then the customer's not going to trust you because you're not going to trust yourself. But it's like having two options potentially. Trust issues. Two options is good. Two options is good. In fact, yeah, because that much clearer event, the the, the one that we did uh, recently, Tommy, was really good. And it tackled a lot of the things that we're talking about here, actually. They called it story selling. Story selling was the idea that you could take somebody within your sort of like sales process on a journey that took them on a series of ups and downs and ups and downs before you get to the point of giving them the price. So the idea is first of all, to listen to them and tell them that there is a solution. And then you tell them, but here are the limitations. But then here's the solution that we have uh, but this is what the industry does, you know, and this is what, you know, so, so it's almost kind of like using your knowledge and experience to take them on a series of motions to lift them up and drop them down at your control. Cause that, that sales journey needs to be moderated by you. You know, they have a need, they might be very high performing professional people who have a tendency to, to run away with their own thoughts, but this conversation isn't their conversation to dictate. This is your conversation to dictate. So from the minute that you start talking, you need to have the ability to bring it back to the, the purpose of this conversation because your time is valuable. You don't have hours to sit here talking about some shit that they want to talk about. You've got a product to sell. Beyond kind of listening to what they say and then letting them know that you either do or you don't have a solution for them, in which case you shoot them off. But say you do have a solution for them, you tell them what that solution is, but then you kind of explain to them perhaps that this is more complex or, you know, than they imagined it would be because it involves X, it involves Y, it involves Z, but they're in the hands of an expert. And you're the expert and you can tell them about your experiences. You can tell them, look, I did work with this, within this industry before. Here's what happened, X, Y, and Z. You know, these are the skills that I have that, that we used. You know, this is how we did X, Y, and Z. People come to you to be their guide within all of these things. A lot of people come into 
a sales journey thinking that they need to be a hero, that somebody's going to come along to you and you're going to need to step up and be a hero and hold a sword in your hand and go vanquish all the dragons on their behalf. That is not what people need. Nobody wants you to be their hero. They want to be the hero. You, you should know? help them. And you're the, you're the person to help them. Yeah. So, you know, they're, they're Frodo. They have the ring. And you're Sam. Well, actually, you're Gandalf in this situation. Yeah. Because you are fucking grey. <laughs> <laughs> it's so unnecessary, I'm sorry. The hobbits are going to Isengard. <laughs> it's all right, Sam. <laughs> it's all right. So they've come to you. And, and, you know, but when you imagine Frodo with his ring, what do you think Frodo's mission is? I don't know. Sell the ring in Lombard. <laughs> His, his mission is to get rid it's of this true. ring and, and, and to go back home. He doesn't really care about the ring or, or where he needs to go. He's lumbered with his mission because he has to, you know, he has to do it. It's his job. But in actual fact, what he wants to do is he wants to go on holiday. Like that's, that's, that's his mission really. And he comes to you and you're like, oh, I can show you how to destroy this ring. And, and you're, you're the guide. You tell them, you tell them, look, I'm the person that's been around. I'm the person that knows. I have the knowledge. I have the experience. But not only that, I'm willing to give them to you, you know, because you're my guy. You know, we're here right now. I think this could work. And if you think it is not going to work, I think also being able to say no is a, is a very important thing. I, mean, I know we don't think about it yeah, very because much. Yeah, Gandalf kind of was manipulator because Frodo yeah. wouldn't go to destroy the ring it's this old guy came to him and give the, him idea that he need to do all this He's way breaking the whole story selling <laughs> he example make, he need to make all this way yeah. to destroy the ring it's true instead so, of because he's the bilbo he wasn't care about this he lived all his life with this ring yeah and it was absolutely not necessary it but this old man just tried to destroy poor kid life <laughs> he did it's true. So what Edgar's taking from this basically is you're saying scam people. <laughs> yeah, it's it's kind of like that. You you are kind of telling this guy to do something that they wouldn't otherwise do, right? You, you are a little bit like that. You're ruining this man's life. Uh, but in actual fact, what you're doing is he already feels like he needs to go on the mission. You're just helping him to ensure that he has all the relevant skills and knowledge and people around him to help him to, to 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 do this mission basically and that's ultimately what you're trying to achieve in that sales journey so you are mm. sam kind of kind of be more sam yeah eat his food at night that's yeah. me i am sam <laughs> <laughs> so, what do you think about ai i recently get a contact with some company who tried to sell to me their services and their proposal was some software uh, basically it's crm system which connected with gpt chat mm -hmm. uh, it creating fake accounts on linkedin looking for potential leads in with uh, goals you add there writing them messages thousand a day or some amount if someone answer it making simple answers what you need, finding out the budget, answering with chat GPT. And then when it decided lead is ready, it forwarded it to you. Mm. So uh, that, that sounds cool, actually. And I can, I can believe something like that could work. I mean, I'd be wary of anybody who tells you that they're just going to give you money. Like there, there are people out there who will just promise you leads and say, look, we're going to get you leads. The leads are going to come and you're going to be rich. You know, I get a lot of ads because I'm an agency and I get a lot of creative services, lead gen ads. And anytime anything says, this is how we're going to get you 10,000 pounds worth of retainers in the first month, I switch off. I switch off because I'm like, realistically, I can't expect somebody to be doing that for me in that way. You know, that's that, that's a, that's a nice thing for somebody to be able to claim. And lead gen is a thing, but it's a lot more, it needs to be a lot more carefully executed. I don't disregard the, the capabilities of chatbots. You know, I use them quite a lot in my own kind of like research sort of methods actually yeah. they're, 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 they're really good and there probably could be a chat bot that could be programmed to you know link with linkedin and have conversations with people people used to do it before actually where they'd hire like somebody in the philippines and give them a, a series of pre-recorded scripts and say right i just want to you know spam people on linkedin with these pre-recorded messages and the minute that they give me a yes just book them into my calendar uh is a thing that people used to do so a version of that 
that works with with a GPT, but probably could work, you know. And and it's it's always worth trying. But I can imagine that comes at a cost, and that cost is perhaps you know is is is, is going to either make that worthwhile or not. I guess to try because I guess you've got to yeah. experiment with it. They ask for eight hundred pounds a month mm. for it, and I don't like any company who propose services like this or ask for pay in advance. If they can generate so much leads, they should be able to work in commission. Otherwise, for me, I see that they not able to bring me anything. Yeah. Because for them, it should be a good deal. Yeah. I can give them 5% for bringing me leads if they give me 200 leads a month. Yeah. And yeah. three of them will be clients. They will earn more than 800, but they always say, oh, no, we have subscription only. Oh, sorry then. Bye. Yeah. Well, I think yeah. lead gen services for small businesses are difficult as well. So I feel like, like I get sold these all the time as well. You know, we'll bring you 10 clients a month. We'll bring you 15 clients a month. It's like in what fucking reality could I take on 15 clients a month? <laughs> you know, we're a small team. It'd be the very quickest way to put myself out of business because everybody would leave we're us. out of the window. Out of what? The window. Out of the window. To be honest, I'd be off the top of the building. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so I think that that's something you need to be really careful about. But then my appetite is to be cautious and sort of the hare and the tortoise on the fat tortoise. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, I think the AI became a problem and it now in the United States, huge protest from cinema community and actors and scenario screenwriters, they protesting against AI because mm -hmm. it's taking their jobs and even the for actors, the visual, the deep fake one. Yeah. You saw a couple of those, how good they are now. They are good. This have is you, scary. Have, have you seen the new uh, season of Black Mirror and the episode Joan is Awful? Yeah. Yeah. Like, I, you know, it's, it's funny because it, it wasn't the most Black Mirror-y series of uh, Black Mirror episodes. You know, they're all sort of horror-y this time, which is a bit odd. But that particular episode was quite true to kind of their style of painting like a dystopian future out of technology and actually that sort of you know deep fake space is is really really starting to get to the point where you know people people are going to start having these sorts of reservations about them hey if you take a look look it's getting more and more pages like this so wow. since when did we become the joe rogan podcast <laughs> hey can you pull that up can you just pull that up yeah just <laughs> no just if you just look how good it is yeah. Because it look exact like Django Ortega. It does. Wow. And it's the videos, it's not the picture, it's not just the AI generated pictures. And it became more and more. So it's Tom Cruise, it's DiCaprio, it's her now. Yeah. I can see how why the actors are scared. Because this episode of Black Mirror, the first one, this is exactly yeah. what's happening. And it's more and more that it's will be real threat. For industry, making yeah. an AI version of me to go to meetings. No, <laughs> no, take some time off. No, next week we're going to be sponsored by an AI company who are going to bring an AI Tommy who is actually semi interesting. <laughs> so overall, what we were speaking today, uh, what advice can you say about sales for a business? How important it is? What people should pay attention? Small business, especially who just starting, short in one minute. Like yeah. three main points. Three main points. Okay, cool. So if you're a small business owner who is just starting to establish your sp space within the industry, you're going to be facing a bit of an uphill climb. But what you can do is firstly ensure that you take on just enough for you to be able to deliver so that the people that you work with are able to experience the best of you because the work that you do in those early stages is going to be ultimately the thing that gives rise to more work from the same people in the future, but also the, the the sentiment about your services and your business that's ultimately going to drive you forward. But in terms of actually selling and selling hard and throughout the course of your business life, it's very important that you hone in on what you're selling, you hone in on who you're selling it to, and you make sure that in your journey with them, you paint yourself as the person who's not only going to solve their problem 
and and give them emancipation from this 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 issue that they're facing but you're also going to be the person that looks after them because you know in in some instances in marketing things don't go according to plan they will say okay we need to push this division of our business so let's let's come up with a marketing plan for this division and that division might tank but they might still want to work with you so your success isn't pinned necessarily to the success of their business because you can't speak for the viability of their proposition or what they do but what you can do is make sure that as the sage, as the person who guides them, they feel able to come to you when things are going well, when things are going badly, and you're able to, to, to be there for them and be their guide to say, look, we've seen this before, we've done this before, this is what we do, the, we're the experts, and you can lean on us for us to be the people that you talk to about this thing. We're not good at that thing, you know, that thing that you've got going on there, you, you should probably find someone for that because actually, you know, we're not one of these people, but we are very good at this, and if this is what you want, this is what we do. Staying away from the temptation to be all things to all people, I think is very important. I think we all do it, you know, I did it, and I still do it sometimes, but actually, the quicker you can move away from doing that and then wanting to be the one size fits all solution. I think it, it ties into the human nature of, of, of people pleasing, doesn't it? You know, the, it, rather than pleasing the person, please their business, you know, do what's needed of you. And yeah, just just be honest, I think is, is a good one. You know, tell people what you can do, tell people what you can't do. When you're going through this sales journey, the most important thing to remember is the outcome of this that you achieve needs to be favorable for you. You can't sell something that chops off your left leg. You know, you need to be able to ask for the price that you need to ask for this thing to make sense for you. And you need to be firm with that. You know, I think there's a lot of temptation at the point of pricing things, especially in the early stages of slashing your prices of thinking, well, actually this website should be 10 grand, but I'm going to try and go for about six to see if I can get it. And, you know, that's something that you will do. But what you'll do is you'll stunt your growth. You'll end up growing a business much slower, you'll end up, you know, creating pressures on, on yourself as far as kind of your ability to hire, to handle the workload that you need because you're not able to to pay people because you haven't got the cash to, to pay them because you've been selling 10,000 pound things for 6,000 pounds, you know. So is being able to be firm in your conviction that what you do is, is truly wonderful, I think. Yeah, that's a great word. Can you make a little pitch for our channel to convince people to subscribe? Yeah. Oh goodness me. All right. Okay. Yeah, you yeah. have to end it with ding dong the bell. Ding dong the bell. Okay. Cool. Got it. It's straight in camera. Come on. Right. You so have thirty seconds. Thirty seconds, ladies and gentlemen. You've been listening to me, Tanvir, on the TED Talks podcast with Tommy and Edgar. Uh, hit the like button, press subscribe, and stay tuned for more action. Thank you for watching this episode. I hope this episode uh, give you some tips about sales, give you some new information, hopefully valuable. Please subscribe to our channel, put likes, leave the comment if information was useful. Thanks for our guest. Thanks Tanvir for coming. Thank you for having me. And we'll see you next week. And don't forget to ding dong the bell.